The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity aside from possibly Cash Like More Hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. And Paul, as always, this feels totally natural. Completely natural. It's like the first time every time. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, we are, for the audience, uh, the people are going to be hearing this at home. We have, we have an audience in front of us, which always, always feels weird. Today, we're going to be talking about myositis with the great Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein, who we will introduce in a moment. But Paul, I, I need to clear the air about something. Yep, lay it on me. Yeah, so we we have been doing the podcast for seven years, uh, as was said in our intro here. And every time we do a podcast featuring somebody from Johns Hopkins, apparently we tend to leave the S off of John. And we get these emails from listeners. And actually, there's been news articles written, not about our show doing this, but just <laughs> Hopkins alumnus writing about how it really irks them. Um, I believe they call it the unforgivable offense, which I can link to in the show notes for those of you who follow the show uh, after the fact. But Paul, with that, would you tell people, uh, what is it that we do on the curbsiders? Because I think people are probably bewildered right now. Sure. No, yeah. Before, and now that we're done apologizing for if we're we've bleeding ever said, listeners. You know, Johnny Hops, we're talking about Steve Osler. Uh, <laughs> we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We <laughs> use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And as you mentioned, we have the great uh, Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein here to talk, about, talk to us about the myopathies and myositis. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, for the people in the room here, our, our learning objectives today were to really, like, we wanted to, we wanted to understand, like, how might you recognize myositis? What is the, as an internist, what is the workup that we should be doing that, that makes sense to do? Like, where's our lane in this? And then finally, as primary care, what, what do we need to do to give high value primary care to people that are, that have myositis that are seeing Dr. Christopher Stein and, and how can we partner to give them good care? So with that, Paul, would you read our guest bio and then let's, let's get on with the interview. Sure. Cause there is nothing less nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> Take than one. To a large group of people in a cathedral like room. <laughs> um, we are thrilled to be joined by Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein, MD, MPH. She is an associate professor of medicine and neurology and the co-founder and director of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center. She joined the faculty of the Division of Rheumatology at the Johns Hopkins University in 2003. In addition, she serves as the co-chair of the Institutional Review Board at the Johns Hopkins University Bayview campus. Doing great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying. She is also one of 24 core faculty members to teach in the Johns Hopkins Medical School Colleges Advisory Program, which provides clinical skills instruction in the first year of medical school and continued career advising throughout all four years of the medical school. As a clinician scientist, she is the principal investigator of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Registry, currently numbering over 3,000 patients recruited worldwide, developed by her and her colleagues. She has an interest in patient-reported outcomes and has been the co-chair of an international effort through the Outcome Measures in Rheumatology Organization. And without further ado, may I present Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein. You know, Paul, I, I remembered, I just wanted to interrupt you. You just ruined the applause break, I, 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 Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> pause. And this is where a broadest applause so that they know we're going to slide. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. There we go. That's appropriate. Now you can chastise I, me. I was good. maybe another applause break. Applause break after this, Paul, because I I wanted to. This is where we normally uh, in the show. I just Paul. I wanted to say, you know, on the show, I have a little bit of a reputation for weird picks of the week. I've recommended a jump rope. I've recommended a pull up bar. More recently, Paul, I've been playing video games, as you know, and actually to quite some acclaim, I've actually won an award. Right, do what you got to do, man. So. <laughs> Actually, it was atrophy, Paul, a trophy, because this is a sh <laughs> show about don't, myositis. Don't, don't. You do this. Audience, you don't have to indulge if this. If you want to applaud that, <laughs> applause break? No? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Dr. Christopher Stein, before we get started, is it okay if we call you Lisa, because this is meant to be just like an informal, very casual conversation between colleagues? Can we call you Lisa? Absolutely. Okay. So, Lisa, can you give the audience a one-liner about yourself and maybe throw in a hobby or interest outside of medicine? Maybe you want to talk about axe throwing, not to set you up, but please. Sure. So, good morning, everybody. As you heard, I'm Lisa Christopher Stein. I'm an adult rheumatologist. I also have a joint appointment in the Department of Neurology. 
Uh, I came here to Hopkins in 2001 to do a two to three year fellowship. And 21 years later, I grow where I'm planted. I've found a <laughs> great family at Hopkins as an extended family for me. Uh, you heard in the intro, I was the co-founder of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center, and I was explaining prior to starting that we commemorated the 15th anniversary of that center last night by all of us going axe throwing, which I highly recommend, and I suggest that the wellness committee take this on. It was, it was a fantastic bonding. I think Paul and I are going to hit it up on the way home today. <laughs> yeah, highly recommended. Um, I live in Baltimore City. I've been married to my husband of 24, almost 24 years, which I met at a summer camp as counselor. So we've been oh, wow. a million years together. That is, yeah. So, yeah. And I have two boys uh, who are 16 and 12, uh, and a cat for almost 20 years. And other than the cat, everybody's taller than me in my house. <laughs> uh, and uh, I really enjoy, I think for about myself, what I love is sort of stepping out of my comfort zone, doing something new, and this definitely qualifies. Podcasting uh, in front of a live audience? Yeah, it's not for everyone, but you're doing great. We'll see. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think you said hobby or interest. I think my two favorite hobbies are travel, especially internationally, and entertaining, and both of those were awesome since 2020. Yeah. Um, so I, I think now, you know, for the pivot for me has been uh, outdoor entertaining. Love to have people at our home. We have a 100 and almost 20 year old home have wraparound porch, and really appreciated being outdoors with people I love. So that's, that's definitely my forte. Excellent. And our, our typical follow-up question is any recent book, movie, show, any piece of culture that you've enjoyed lately that you think other people would benefit from or also enjoy? Yeah, I, I think one of the most important books, which is a quick read, is uh, Gillian Horton's We're All Perfectly Fine, which is a, it's a memoir. It's a, her personal memoir. She's a Canadian physician. And she's involved in student education and uh, you know, in clinical practice. And mid-career realized, for lack of a better word, some burnout. She was really feeling fatigued. Goes to a retreat, and the book is funny. It's heartbreaking. It's just a great read. And I think it's great for any doctor, but I think it's really good for the general, you know, even outside of general medical practice. I can't recommend it enough. Quick read and a very important one. Well, maybe one last question before we get on to the interview. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of young people here in the audience and also in our listener, listening audience. What, what is some career advice that you, that you want people hearing this to take with them that you found valuable? It doesn't have to be the best you've ever heard, just like some advice. That's a great question. I, there's so much advice I think you hear throughout your career. I, I actually I think the, probably one of the most memorable things I heard was actually not by the speaker, but by someone attending a conference. So I often go to how to say no to things, how to be more efficient, yeah. many of those. And it was someone who stood up who said, one of her mentors told her, if you don't like the sound of a project that's due in four to six months from now, today, it's not going to be any better in four to six months from now, which is, sounds obvious, but I really yeah. catalog that, and it helps me make sure that my priorities are set. Paul, this reminds me of the what a past guest told us. She always says, thank you so much. I'm honored to be considered for this. Let me think about it and talk it over with my inner circle. And then that would really decrease the number of times you say yes to something that like six months from now, you're like, why did past me say yes to this? I, it's 100%. And it's a great trick by the person offering it to be like six months from now, because that just seems so abstract. You're like, yeah, no, I'm, totally, yeah, I'm sure I won't be doing anything at that time. That sounds great. And that's just so easy to say yes to something like that. So that's a great advice. We are so excited to bring you season two of Curbsiders Teach, our special mini series on teaching and medicine. I'm Dr. Molly Hoyblein. And I'm Dr. Ira Krzynowska. So pumped to be back with you, Molly, on season two, where we cover fascinating topics such as precepting models, teaching physical exam skills, tips for supporting learners of all abilities, and more. We know you'll find valuable skills in this Curbsiders Teach podcast series. So let's unlock your potential to be a great medical educator. Join us weekly in late summer 2022 to hear expert interviews bringing you teaching pearls and practice changing knowledge to inspire the next generation of medical educators. Listen to the Curbsiders Teach wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Grammarly and audience. You know that I'm a big fan of Grammarly because at the Curbsiders, we are putting out a lot of written content, whether it's our emails or our show notes that go on the website. And a little peek behind the curtain, we work on our show notes in Google Docs before they go live on our WordPress website. Grammarly plugs right into Google Docs and it can suggest full sentence rewrites with Grammarly Premium, tells us where we've misspelled words, where we're missing punctuation. It's great and it saves us a lot of time and it can save you a lot of time too. 
So right now, get to the point faster and accomplish more with Grammarly. Go to Grammarly.com slash curb to sign up for a free account. And when you're ready to upgrade to Grammarly Premium, get 20% off for being our listener. That's 20% off at G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash curb. One last time, Grammarly.com slash curb. But Paul, you know, uh, we've been talking, we talked about Cash Lack last night at dinner and uh, Cash Lack, actually not a real place. Sorry, people uh, <laughs> who tried to apply to it on ERAS. But Paul, I believe we have a case from Cash Lack. We do stellar transition, seven years. We're doing Thank great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk to you about Chris. Chris is a 52 year old male. He has a history of high blood pressure. He's on the Cinepril and hydrochlorothiazide. He has hypercholesterolemia with an LDL of 195 at baseline. Um, 100 on treatment, he's on high-dose atorvastatin. He's seen in your office for routine fall for high blood pressure, and just for context, this is a primary care office right now. Over the past six months, Chris has been having low energy, gradual difficulty climbing stairs. His kids make fun of him for having trouble getting out of deep chairs. It just takes him a long time to get up. So based on what Chris is telling us so far, is there anything that sort of, so obviously we're, we're doing a talk on my, myopathy and myositis, but in the primary care office, as this might trigger the thought about this, are there anything else in the history that you would want to know, or sort of where should we start with Chris? Sure. I, I think we'll take his symptoms at, at baseline and the fact that it's been going on for six months. So um, we'll talk about all things, I guess, myopathy. But if you're thinking about the inflammatory myopathies, myositis, it's generally a subacute process. So six months would not be unusual. I thought it was interesting you said that his kids pointed this out to him. I find it amazing the amount of denial that people will have in telling themselves they're getting older. And <laughs> newsflash 52, please, is not old. But people will say, oh, I didn't, I thought I was just getting a little older, a little stiffer. Um, so that is, a, you know, of, of importance to me. Um, I also want to mention the atorvastatin. So surely something that is myopathic. Uh, so uh, direct myotoxin. So or we can talk a little about this, but atorvastatin can also be associated with an autoimmune version of statin myopathy. So all of those things are sort of uh, I'm thinking about them, and I don't hear any pain or stiffness. I mostly hear weakness. And then you mentioned a deep chair. So most people can get off a higher seated chair. Where they get into trouble with myopathy is lower chair. So a low couch, uh, toilet seats. I don't hear anything about upper body yet, so I'd be curious more about that. We'll talk more about that. So deep-seated chairs, subacute, and then the fatigue. So trying to dissemble sort of people say they're weak. This guy sounds like he's both weak and fatigued. Separating sort of asthenia, this fatiguing feel versus true weakness, very important. Are there follow-up questions you asked to, to suss that out with, between the two? Yeah, I mean, I think... It, it, I often will say, look, if there is a, what if there's a, you're in a movie theater and it's a crowd of movie theaters, a fire, how easily is it that you just don't want to get out of that chair? It's a little hard, you're stiff, or you really can't get out of that chair. Does somebody have to, you know, help you? Have you had to use chair arms to physically push off the chair? That's definitely sort of different than just overall fatigue and also then separating out joints. So a lot of people will say, especially in the small joints of the hands more than the hips, they'll say it's, I'm, it's weak, I can't turn a jar, I can't. And I'm like, is it weak or is it a little bit of stiffness or pain? Mm -hmm. So just teasing those questions out. In primary care every day, you, you see the person with osteoarthritis in the knee that says, oh yeah, I have trouble getting up from a chair because of the, the knee pain or stiffness. But this, what we're trying to give here is a flavor that's totally different uh, right, with and, this person. Right, and painless. So right. again, you right. can have pain. You can certainly have pain with the inflammatory myopathies, which is what we actually are not taught. We're taught it's a painless weakness. But having pain in the absence of weakness, highly, highly atypical of an inflammatory myopathy. So you generally weak without pain, maybe weak with a little pain, not pain on its own, and really making sure that there's no pain that is, is the responsible component of that statement. I, I definitely want to talk more about the exam as well. Is there, do you, like if you start to get the, the sense, someone like this, that they might have myopathy, myositis, do you start to go through a different review of systems? Like, do you recommend we ask certain high yield questions that should then really like key us in more that we're going to do, do a, a baseline workup for that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think for here, I haven't heard yet at all about any rash. So asking them, and sometimes it might not be visible on that exam. Usually it's persistent, but mm -hmm. sometimes the rashes that go along with uh, the inflammatory myopathies, dermatomyositis can come and go. Uh, so asking specifically about rashes, high-yield rashes would be the eyelids or the MCP, MPIP joints. 
Uh, fatigue they've already talked about, so this feeling of being unwell. Systemic symptoms, so when I'm really thinking about inflammatory processes, remember it's not really just muscles, it's all the systems. Yeah. So thinking about that in a systemic process, you know, are they um, losing weight? Are there fevers? Do they have Raynaud's phenomenon? A 52-year-old man, highly atypical, to have uh -huh. new onset Raynaud's at, at the age of 52. Young woman in her 20s, not so much. Or sometimes people come in, but have had Raynaud's for years, so that's less typical of an autoimmune process. So let me give you a little bit more history, because, and then I, I want to hear sort of what your physical examination would look like for this patient. Sure. So let's, let's say that our patient has been, he says occasionally he chokes on food, um, say solids and liquids, and he attributes this to eating too fast, not something he thought so much about, maybe this came out during the review of systems. He also, speaking of rashes, notes some hyperpigmentation of the neck and the upper back that is itchy for him, and then he sometimes also has burning and itching of the scalp. So he's giving you some more sort of inflammatory um, symptoms as, as, as you're talking things through. I, I'm wondering, first of all, if this history changes anything, and then I would love to hear sort of what your examination would look like for this particular patient. Yeah, so now you have somebody with weakness. Now, we don't know labs. We're not sure. We're thinking the weakness is true weakness and a rash. The rash that you tell me about is not the prototypic rash or the pathognomonic rash. I'm not hearing eyelids, MCPs yet. Scalp is very important uh, in, in a lot of the autoimmune diseases, but especially in, in dermatomyositis, where scalp is often involved, itchy, and we miss it because it's under your hair. So the patient often has to tell you about it, so remembering to, to think about that. The hyperpigmentation is of interest to me. It can be, this has been going on six months, so it's possible that some of the hyperpigmentation represents uh, post-inflammatory rashes. I'll just make one note that depending, I don't, I, I don't know the skin tone of the patient, in darker skin tones, hyperpigmentation can certainly still be post-inflammatory, but we're finding that we see hyperpigmentation sometimes as the first process where it's an active rash. I think typically we're always taught about this idea of violaceous or red rashes, and I want to be clear that I really think we need to be careful about understanding the spectrum of skin tone. Yeah, a, a quick plug for the Skin of Color Society, which they they have a great website that has very uh, they have nice pictures on there trying to like address this disparity in dermatology and medicine uh, medical images specifically, and a lot of dermatologists are trying to fix this now, which is good um, because I agree with you. If you look up textbooks, it, it's it's mostly lighter color skin. So for the for this patient here, we've we've. We're, we're keying in, we think that this person has true weakness, um, they have some rash now, and anything else, like on the exam, I, I, you, you taught me some, some cool things. So what is the appropriate way to test for muscle weakness, let's say of the neck or at the hips? Sure, I, I think muscle weakness is generally tested by resisting an examiner. You're, you're trying to see whether or not the person can resist your full strength. The two muscle groups that I think we forget to examine supine are the neck flexors and the hip flexors. The reason that is is that if you are seated, you can sort of recruit and cheat a bit, and so it is not unusual for a trainee to tell me somebody is strong at the hips because they haven't uh, put them in the supine position. And then, technically speaking, hip extensors should be examined uh, uh, prone. So those are the three uh, muscle groups that really need to be examined positionally to bring out the true weakness. So you have them laying on the table, you put your hand on their upper thigh and, and try to resist against them that way? Yeah, and when you examine any muscle group, I always sort of think of it as a fulcrum, and so you want to be closest to the next, the, the, the furthest joint the furthest down. furthest joint, Because okay. you want to give yourself and them, them the, you want the unfair advantage, right? Okay. So you want to have the lever when you're... So you're, you're close to the knee yep, when you're testing. Right the hip. Okay, yep. got it. And we were talking a little bit before we started about grip strength, which apparently I've been doing long for the past um, yeah. over a decade. Yeah, so this, was, this was a revelation as well. A great chance to correct me in front of a large group. I want to be clear. No, you can definitely test grip strength. You're not doing it wrong. But one of the, I think, little pearls that I've been taught by my neurology colleagues, because distal strength can give us a wider differential, things like inclusion body myositis or other uh, neurologic processes, we really be careful when we test hand strength in particular. So forearm flexors are the most common distal, distal group of muscles that's affected, especially with IBM, inclusion body myositis. So I teach trainees now to crease your fingers to the first palmer crease. It's not really a true grip, but rather the first palmer crease. Mm -hmm. And then try to pry those fingers up. And I think if you try, people are sitting there doing it in the audience, you can't 100%. help yourself, but you have to do it. Right? Pry your friend's fingers. I can convince you that it seems like that should be weak. The, the little, like, frail, oldly 
lady of 90 can hold her finger flexors tight. So otherwise, if you grip, you can recruit your intrinsics and cheat. And we really miss subtle early forearm flexor weakness. So a little pearl just to remember, first palm or crease. Can you tell us similarly, how do you test for the neck flexor weakness? Because this is, if re, correct me if I'm wrong, people often with myositis have weakness of the neck flexors that's out of proportion to the neck extensors? Yes, correct. So again, that's supine. You ask the patient to uh, flex their neck up off the bed, off the am examining I, table. Am I holding their forehead down in an aggressive way <laughs> dur during this? Handle uh, the throat. Uh, no, no. I, I recommend reasonable force, very reasonable force, and you can usually tell. So um, someone, yes, please be careful with their neck. Ask if they have any neck issues, uh, and you're pushing down, and you really should be able to see them within reason, resist your your, your strength fully. It's okay. again impressively how people can hold their neck pretty, uh, right. you know, pretty strong. So you test uh, supine for the flexors and then prone for the extensors of the neck at, hip, the, no, hip, the, hip. at the hip. The neck extensors can be also neck done um, by lying flat. So it's okay. um, supine neck flexors extensors. The only real muscles that need to be done prone are the hip extensors. Okay. And we should, I mean, I guess get on to diagnostics eventually, but I do, I, we sort of alluded to some of these things, but if you wouldn't mind just sort of cataloging sort of skin findings specifically that we should be particularly cognizant of or looking for just so that we actually have them kind of grouped together. If that'd sure. Be helpful. Um, yeah. And this, uh, this is, has a large differential. So the, if I'm thinking about skin rashes in the myositis world, so obviously right there's skin rashes in lupus and other rheumatic diseases, the prototypic ones I've told you about before are eyelids and MCPs, but we look for V, uh, V-neck sign, so on the, on the chest, the back, which across the shoulders is a shawl sign. Some people also have um, arm erythema. We look for what's called a holster sign, where obviously hold a gun holster, and that's on the lateral hips. We look for uh, both either flat or papular areas on extensor surfaces. So in addition to the MCPs and PIPs, all the extensor surfaces, so that's ankles, knees, elbows. If it's flat, we usually call that, it's called Gautron sign. If it is, if it's something where you close your eyes and you can feel it, it's usually Gautron's papule. So either it, it can be either flat or papular. Uh, tends to be, as we talked about, erythematous, but mm -hmm. can also be hyperpigmented. The, and, and from my reading, the, the heliotrope rash around the eyes and the Gotrin's papules on the hands are pathognomonic for dermatomyositis. Is, is, are there other things that cause that? I mean, to me, it looks kind of nonspecific, and I might, I, I might mistake it. Like, does this person just, like, get hit in the eyes? <laughs> uh, are they wearing their goggles too tight or something? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure I know a differential for heliotrope. It's usually pretty much solid. That, although, actually, psoriasis. So in, in some cases, psoriatic lesions can actually appear on the mm. upper eyelid. T t tends not to ring the eyelid. So when you see on the upper and lower lid margin, uh, that's, uh, that's consistent with the heliotrope. Although a heliotrope can be below the lid, above the lid, both. Uh, so that's really, I don't think tight goggles is on my list. Yeah. Uh, as, as, uh, as far as, um, as kn the knuckles or the MCPs, there's something called knuckle pads, which uh, is repetitive trauma. So, um, so anything that can cause trauma on the knuckles, and mm. that's usually, again, seen in isolation, wouldn't be seen with other rashes. So mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of what I'm thinking. Okay. That's, that's very helpful. And we, we had a prior show, we talked about scalp a little bit, mostly for hair loss. Is alopecia a prominent feature, or is it more just the itching, burning of the scalp that they... It's both. I'm glad you brought that up. So in general, people can have like full loss, uh, total hair loss in the beginning when the disease is very active. Mm. So alopecia is something we ask about, scalp rash. And the one thing I should mention about these rashes is that they're generally pruritic. They're often photosensitive, but not exclusively. So obviously the V sign is often photosensitive, but most people don't necessarily have you know uh, their hips exposed per se so we see these rashes in the winter so it's not you know exclusive to that and the itch is really important uh, we can talk about differential but most rashes interestingly many the the, uh, the thing that gets most confused with these rashes is lupus and lupus tends to not itch and dermatomyositis is an incredibly pruritic rash the scalp is the probably the most itchy area for patients and I really think you can't underestimate it it sounds benign but many patients really uh, tell me that that has been the most significant part of their illness. It's it, they can't sleep, they can't function. So scalp itch, while sounding like seemingly benign, is, it can be pretty significant. All right, people. So look out for the scalp itch in your patients. I know now it's going to be one of those things that is going to just like 
kick kick off in my in my mind when I'm talking to people. <laughs> well, be, I mean, with, within reason, with all of with the other this, things, yes. right? Certainly, scalp itches for a hundred other reasons, but yes, in this yeah. in this no, case, I, I think I think we just established this path in mnemonic. I feel good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't I don't I don't know about you, Paul, but in the back of my mind, whenever I'm seeing anyone in primary care with any kind of pain or weakness, I'm always in the, in my head like. Do they have rashes? Is there inflammatory arthritis? Like I'm thinking like arthralgia, arthritis, could this be a connective tissue disease? And so it's good to try to put these together. Um, oftentimes it's something else, but I, I'm always, I always try to get excited about this sort of thing and not miss it. No, I think I, I'm glad you mentioned arthritis. That's one of the things in the beginning when we talked about associated symptoms like Raynaud's and other things that can be autoimmune. Arthritis sometimes is a presenting symptom. So mm -hmm. sometimes patients really present with an inflammatory arthritis uh, that is often symmetric and they get labeled as rheumatoid arthritis before any of this develops. So a, a good history for an inflammatory process in the joints, very right. important. Okay. Well, why don't we get on to some, some Should labs? Should we give the exam first? Oh, yeah. Give, okay. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you always trying to jump to the diagnosis? This is a recurring theme. So <laughs> let's, let's tell you what Chris actually looks like, and then we can talk about um, maybe what we're starting to think about here. So on examination, Chris has normal muscle bulk and tone, um, no rails on lung examination, no, no findings of heart failure, um, benign cardiac exam. We're calling it four plus out of five strength in both the shoulders and four minus out of five strength in both hips. Grip strength is normal, though I may or may not have assessed it correctly. <laughs> he has no plaques on his hands. He does have some mild redness of his upper eyelids, cheeks, and nose, including the nasolabial folds, but not his chin or forehead. So now, now we have the examination. Now, Matt, if you want to move on to actually starting to diagnose the patient, you can go to the Yeah, no, so let's, let's interpret these physical exam findings. I mean, we've, we've talked about a lot of it already. Based on this, are, are, you're, are you more worried about this person? What, what diagnosis do you think is most likely right now or what's in the differential? I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. And it, so if it were the rash alone in the absence of weakness, again, on the differential, uh, sometimes psoriasis, sometimes, they often get diagnosed with eczema, which at this point, I don't think that's the case, yeah. but that's the number one diagnosis first, for sure. And then lupus. And you mentioned in your description that it's, uh, it, it was inclusive of the nasolabial folds. Another quick clinical pearl. I, my patients actually made shirts for me that say it's not lupus because they <laughs> often get told it's lupus. Uh, and it, the nasolabial folds are included uh, and not spared in dermatomyositis, and they are almost always spared in lupus. So that's a quick, quick look-see that you can save your patient from the wrong diagnosis. So I think talking about the, the differential diagnosis or the mimics, uh, you, you just mentioned lupus, and I think that's what I, yeah, so mi the mimics, like what should be in our differential uh, as, as an internist seeing this person, we're thinking maybe myositis, but what else do we need to think about? And, and we, can, we can go from there. Sure. So I think if, if the rash is a non-prominent component in the beginning, so when you first heard about the patient where not seeing the rashes as much, it's difficult when the rashes are so clear like this, you're really sort of zoning, you know, I think one, two, and three would be dermatomyositis. But if we step back and we think about myositis in general, the most common mimics, especially in the absence of a rash, we see adult onset muscular dystrophy, which is not, it's, it's not common, but it's certainly, it's, it's not rare in the sense that we make the diagnosis a fair amount. This can look identical clinically. Actually, interestingly, when we get to the biopsy, it can be an inflammatory process. Mm -hmm. So having an index of suspicion there, for sure. Think simple things like endocrinopathies. I would lie to you if I told you I haven't missed hypothyroidism. So hypo or hyperthyroidism, just making sure um, that that's not concomitant there. In, in, when we look at myopathy, we think about neurodegenerative or neurologic processes. So um, inclusion body myositis, uh, which is one of the inflammatory myopathies, but one that we talked about and why that grip slash finger flexor weakness is so important. Uh, and then motor neuron disease. So uh, not unfortunately, un infrequently, um, ALS is a mimic of this. Actually, you can even see mildly elevated muscle enzymes. So careful exams there, and we'll get to the exam, but it's very important to do a full exam, including a neurologic exam. Um, talked about endocrinopathies. Infection in the sky, I don't think so. It's been a subacute process, but post-viral, we would think about those kind of things. Uh, and then finally, I guess, uh, myasthenia. So not uncommon for some, some patients with myasthenia can present with pure weakness where we're not seeing the, the fatigability. And this gentleman is fatigued, but when we talk about fatigability versus fatigue, really sort of trying to tease that out. And sometimes they actually go hand in hand where we see you know, uh, myasthenia in combination with um, an inflammatory myopathy. So we, we went through the differential here, which is a broad differential. And I personally, it sounds like I might need neurology, maybe dermatology, multiple different 
consultants to help me weigh in, uh, certainly rheumatology. But uh, Chris is on a stat, and we told you, he he's in the, that high-risk category. His LDL was greater than 190. He's taking us to our statin. He's done some reading on the internet, and he says, Doc, I'm worried. Should I just stop my statin now? Because I, I think maybe that's causing my weakness. In general, how do you talk to patients about statin? Or when primary care doctors ask you, what's your opinion of statins? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, so I spend a lot of time thinking about statins and the toxicity thereof. I think in general, they're they're very good drugs. I see some cardiologists in the audience, and I <laughs> <laughs> promise you I'm not going to take away your statin. Uh, <laughs> So for this guy, because he's on a myotoxic agent, we first try to take all of those off, at least initially. And so I think I, while patients with inflammatory myopathies can, in general, actually take statins safely, I always remove them for in the beginning. I love to talk about atorvastatin. I'll take a, a moment, any of the statins, but atorvastatin in particular is an offender in two, or two ways because it's often given at high dose. Mm -hmm. So high-intensity statins off the bat versus uh, st ramp up. I can't tell you for sure if high dose versus low dose necessarily causes more toxicity, but it's surely in the, there's two forms of statin myopathy that are in my head. For this guy, uh, he's got a rash, and so it's a little atypical for the autoimmune version, but there's direct myotoxicity from statins, which you're all familiar with, much more common. That can be anything from myalgia to rhabdomyolysis. And then years ago, uh, my colleagues and I described autoimmune statin myopathy, and that is a more sort of insidious process where which is very interesting, is the patient generally on a statin on average for about 30 to 36 months. It's a th almost three years in. So it really breaks the rules in your head when thinking about how hmm. could the statin be playing a role. That's easily teased out by um, some labs that are they're quick, that are uh, usually by the rheumatologist or the neurologist. Sure. I did. I wanted to talk about labs for a second. I'm just trying to think if this patient presented to my office, how, you know, fatigue being one of the banes of primary care. If someone comes in saying they're tired, I'm like, well, we're all tired. Like, I don't know. What, what is it that you want from me? And I'm trying to think about <laughs> what my workup would look like. And if I gave myself a little bit of credit, so I think I would probably do a CBC. I would, I would probably do a CMP because everyone gets one just by walking through the door. Because they're on a statin, I would probably throw in the CK. And then let's say, and then the TSH for the hypothyroidism, and let's pretend for a second I was a student enough to actually find a rash, and then I, I talked myself into lupus, so I just threw in an ANA, and this 52-year-old gentleman, is that, does that make sense? Is there anything else that you would add to that? Or I guess a better question to ask you is sort of what, what serologic workup makes sense for Chris here? I think you've really mentioned most of the important uh, functions. I'll, I'll walk you through. First of all, I appreciate your brutal honesty. It's so true, right? Isn't everybody tired? Uh, so uh, so uh, TSH, great. And again, also because hypothyroidism can be concomitant with these processes, we can see Hashimoto's and other autoimmune thyroiditis. So important there. And it also can be the driver of the process. So uh, thyroid is very important. CBC, interestingly, we almost learned nothing from CBC except that uh, we expect a normal hemoglobin hematocrit, which is atypical. Almost every one of our diseases in rheumatic diseases have an anemia of chronic disease. I cannot explain this to you, but uh, when we see an anemia, we generally don't see a hemolytic anemia. We do not see anemia of chronic disease. When I see an anemia, I'm wondering about uh, blood loss and, and iron deficiency, and then I'm going down the cancer route, which we'll talk about. Oh wow! Yeah, that is that skipped that that totally. Um, I did I did not pick that up in my pre-reading, so that's a great tip. I think it's really not really appreciated, and then I it, it seems atypical with all this inflammation. Mm -hmm. Why that's the case? So in general, it's not like you can't have it, but it's really the exception, not the rule. And then platelets can help us. So obviously, they're sometimes elevated with an inflammatory process. You can see uh, thrombocytosis in the beginning. The CMP. Uh, probably the most notable thing that we see elevated are the poorly named liver function tests, so transaminases that go up. And I think just as a pearl, uh, for somebody on a torvastatin who's being monitored, they're monitored for their liver function, but they're not monitored for their CK. And so just, if I can just publicly announce that please don't do two liver biopsies before you check a CK, uh, <laughs> which um, it's really, it's not hyperbole, I've seen it. Uh, yeah. so, um, so it's very important. So I love that you included the CK. Some people might say an aldolase, most primary care physicians probably don't check an aldolase. I'll mention the aldolase because it is also an, another muscle enzyme. Sometimes it's elevated in isolation. The aldolase can go up because of muscle origin. It can also go up because of the fasciitis that is part of dermatomyositis. So again, another little pearl. Sometimes I'm trying to tease out what that aldolase is all about. 
You mentioned an ANA. I love that you talked about it. This is the bane of my existence as a rheumatology fellow is trying to debunk. We share your pain in primary (laughs) care. I mean, I I don't know that anyone loves ANAs. Yeah, Uh, yeah, for sure. And so I guess it's, it's, again, uh, another pearl. And really what was remarkable is I've had, you know, trainees call and say the ANA is negative. This probably, this can't be, can this be myositis? turns out, yes. For dermatomyositis, most of the dermatomyositis cases are actually ANA positive. There are, there is at least one subtype and We won't get into the thick of autoantibodies, but we're getting so specific now that there are myositis-specific antibodies, which we wouldn't ask you all necessarily to send a myositis panel, although I know a lot of my internal medicine colleagues are getting facile with this here. And so an ANA is generally positive in dermatomyositis, but can be negative um, in at least one subset. And then most of the other autoimmune myopathies, the, the, the myositis antibodies are actually cytoplasmic. So we'll see a normal ANA. The thing I didn't hear you mention, I don't think I remembered, is, a, is an ESR and a CRP. And again, I can't tell you why, just like the anemia, for the most part, mm-hmm. somebody in the absence of lung disease, we do actually see for whatever reason, we'll talk about the other organs, but in lung disease, we see sed rate and CRP go up. Obviously for severe joint disease, yes. Isolated uh, muscle disease in skin, tends not to raise your sed rate or CRP. So once again, you don't have to think you've missed the diagnosis because the sed rate is four. I, and, and we normally, when we talked about, uh, we, we did a prior show on lupus and one of the, the, the big labs there were urinalysis and CBC is urine out. I didn't really see it. I, I don't have it on the list here and maybe now's a good time for Paul to tell people the labs, but I, I think we, we didn't have it. So urinalysis, not as much. Right. So we just don't generally see renal disease, uh, with the myopathies. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's go with the labs. So the, the CMP comes back. The AST is 110. The ALT is 65, the ALKFOS is 150, the CK is, is up a little bit at 480, the aldolase is also elevated. The CBC is normal, uh, as are the creatinine, the potassium, the SR, the CRP, the TSH, and the ANA. Those all come back A-OK. Um, so does that change anything for you at all, or fairly consistent with what you were expecting? Fairly consistent, although again, you know, if the ANA indeed is correct, which again, there are some lab inconsistencies, sometimes we repeat those things. So assuming that the ANA in fact is um, within normal limits, and I'm sort of thinking uh, about certain subtypes of dermatomyositis, but everything else I think really is consistent with what we just talked about. How we care for our minds affects how we experience life. So it's really important that we invest time and care into keeping our minds healthy. And there's lots of ways to do that. I try to expose myself to new experiences. I try to get enough sleep. I try to exercise. Um, and, And how everyone does this is gonna be individual. For some people, therapy might be a very helpful way to keep your mind uh, pristine and well-maintained so that you can have it working effectively for you for the rest of your life. Um, It's a, I've said it time and time again, it's a stressful world. We live in stressful times. And sometimes we need a little bit of help organizing our thoughts and processing our emotions in a way that keeps our brains healthy. BetterHelp is an online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat therapy sessions so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It can be much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. And now, our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Curb. That's BetterHelp.com slash Curb. This episode is brought to you by Wild Grain. And audience, I'm so excited about Wild Grain because I'll have to say, during the pandemic, I heard about all these people making their bread. They had their sourdough starters. But for me, guess what? I'm a little bit lazy and I'm intimidated by baking bread. So that was a non-starter. But guess what? Now you can get delicious fresh baked bread right at home from Wild Grain. So let me tell you about it. Wild Grain is the first Bake from frozen box for artisanal bread. Plus, they have amazing rolls, pastries, and even handmade pastas. They use only clean ingredients such as unbleached and non-GMO flour. And they utilize a slow sourdough fermentation process that's healthier for you and tastes better than anything you can find in a grocery store. Every item bakes from frozen in 25 minutes or less. Plus, for every new member, Wild Grain donates six meals to the Greater Boston Food Bank. And they've already donated over 120,000 meals so far. Hungry already? Well, for a limited time, you can get $30 off the first box plus free croissants in every box when you go to wildgrain.com slash curb to start your subscription. You heard me. Free croissants in every box and $30 off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash curb. That's wildgrain.com slash curb or you can use the promo code curb at checkout.
I, I think, Paul, at this point, you would be probably sending this person to a rheumatologist. Oh, that would have happened like three visits ago. Three yeah, visits that, ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, because uh, I, I always enjoy hearing, like, I think part of the best thing that's come out of the show is when guests give us, like, a script. Like, what does it sound like when you talk to this person about something, Paul? Yes. I don't know. I, I don't speak well. How about you? <laughs> no, I'm all right. <laughs> Uh, so how about, uh, Lisa, can you tell us, what does it sound like? You're seeing Chris in the office, you have these labs back, you have the history, the exam that we've talked about so far. Uh, what would you talk to him about? Like, what, what do you think he has? What does this mean for him? He, he probably wants to know, do I have cancer? Am I going to die early? Those kind of things. But what might this sound like if we were just listening in, in the room? I think I would tell, start out by saying that the disease looks most consistent with dermatomyositis. And if we break up the parts of those words, that's dermato, which is skin in myo, muscle, and itis inflammation. The uh, disease is rare, so uh, about one in 100,000 people, so un unluckily so. You didn't do anything to deserve or get this disease. Uh, this is something that we believe probably has some genetic component, but it's not a genetic disease. So patients want to know, are their family members going to get it? Are the children going to get it? The mm. answer is probably no. There is an increased predisposition to autoimmunity in families, so they may have told me one of their relatives has rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, but or their children might have a slightly increased risk for autoimmune disease in general, but in general, not a familial disease. Mm which I think is important and helps people with their anxiety yeah, that, about that, it. It's such a good point. I mean, Paul, you always make the point, everyone thinks they have cancer, but I think when someone gets diagnosed, uh, a big diagnosis like this, they, they, they worry about family members as well. For sure. And then we talk about the, what I you know, alluded to is the systemic nature of the disease. So even though we talk about skin and muscle, mm -hmm. there is a host of other important things to think about. Two of the major features of the disease are um, lung disease, and that's interstitial lung disease. Uh, and then I tell them that cancer uh, is yeah. uh, uh, associated with dermatomyositis. We're getting pretty good at precision and figuring out some of the antibody testing that will do that's more specific, um, will in fact uh, help us sort of delineate who might be more likely to have cancer. But we're in the beginning, we really do screen everyone. So cancer and lung disease are important. Heart disease, so cardiomyopathy, myocarditis is rare, but important and to remember. And that's with a really good diagnostician. I think at the bedside, we really pick that up. So we don't necessarily interrogate the heart unless we see uh, signs of a, you know, elevated J JVP, we hear an S3, something that suggests that there's clinical heart mm -hmm. failure or a, a tachycardia that's unexplained for sure. Um, so that's a, that's a start. But Unexplained tachycardia gives me tachycardia. Um, <laughs> yes. is, yeah, and I then, do, do not like that. Yeah. And then I think that also just understanding what an autoimmune disease is. So autoimmune essentially is, is obviously telling them that for whatever reason, their immune system has tagged their own muscles and skin as foreign. Um, and we will do further investigation. So the first thing we're going to do is try to make sure we understand the diagnosis. If you would have talked to me years ago, I'd say that you'd have a muscle biopsy, but because the skin is such a good window to understanding autoimmunity, while not specific, we would biopsy the skin. Mm -hmm. um, and that's done by a small three or four millimeter circular punch biopsy done by usually dermatology or sometimes we, some of our rheumatologists do it. Um, we're looking for an interface dermatitis. So they'll undergo a skin biopsy. And then sort of the uh, non-invasive way, the best non-invasive way to see muscle is with an MRI. It's a non-contrasted mm -hmm. MRI of the thighs. We choose the thighs because the thighs are most often involved. It tends to be a symmetrical process, and it's one of the only muscles you can actually see symmetry in at the same time. If you're trying to look at someone's arms, you have to do two images. So uh, for efficiency, it's sending somebody through. So again, no GAD. It's a T1 and STIR or T2. So you're mm -hmm. essentially looking for a T1 image for architecture of the muscle, making sure there's atrophy, which we shouldn't see this early on, and looking for uh, edema in the muscle. Again, you know, edema in the muscle is not always inflammation, uh, but it's, it's, it's certainly in this case highly consistent with that. So explaining that. And then I would, if you want me to go, I don't know if we want to do this now, yeah, so talk we... about meds and what their life looks like. Yeah, well, I think maybe the to the workup. So I I had tried to put together a list, and you went through the organs. So you said muscle, uh, MRI. You said lungs. So we might think about PFTs or high res CT if we have a suspicion for ILD. Or almost always. Almost so I always, usually yeah. do a baseline PFT and a high res. Yeah. So a CT scan of the chest. Actually, we we often what we do once is chest, abdomen, and pelvis because you can both look for ILD as well as solid tumors. Okay. So we actually do CT. There's there's some controversy as to how much we 
screen and what we screen with. Yeah. But, so uh, that's a little controversial. I think we'll have a better answer soon. People are here for your expert opinion, so you can <laughs> you can tell them to do a chest, abdomen, pelvis. If I'll that's tell what them you that like to do once, yeah. once. Don't you know, don't don't keep doing that every year, but once is good. And once then, is good. Yeah. It's, it's front loaded, right? The cancer diagnosis is front loaded the first five years or so. It kind of yeah, and really the or, first one year. So I mean, it, for sure, five years is what the literature will tell you. So the first year, one year prior and one year after, if you look very carefully at the time of diagnosis, that time period is the most critical for cancer. Mm. Three years seems to be the good, the, the, the cut point where we get a little bit less anxious. But the idea of routine, uh, continuing scanning, we don't do that. And in addition to chest, abdomen, and pelvis, this is a male, so uh, you know, a, a prostate exam. Um, we do, I do do, again, somewhat controversial, but I do do, in, in a gentleman of this age, it would be a PSA, a good mm. prostate exam should be done, and uh, a colonoscopy. And if it were a woman, um, we'd add on mammography. Yeah. Paul, and I think we, 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 did we give this person some choking, right? They were, they were they having some swallowing dif well. difficulty. Yeah. yeah, so in that case, because of the dysphagia, which is not uncommon, it's really generally not GI, but more speech and swallow that we okay. would probably refer to, what we would refer to for cineosophogram and trying to understand it's almost always upper pharyngeal weakness rather than lower GI. Our, our cousins to these diseases that overlap, like scleroderma and such, tend to affect the entire GI tract at times. This one really sticks mostly at the esophagus level so most of the time in in very rare cases we can have gut involvement but that's that's again very exceptional so I, I think maybe now to recap a little bit what we talked about because we gave a big list uh, the, for the audience in person they have a slide that has the list of the the tests we might consider but we said for the muscles MRI uh, particularly the thigh muscles might be a spot we look um, I think uh, EMG nerve conduction study depending that it, I've seen some sources say that we didn't really get to that so, yeah well as a, as a rheumatologist right I, I, I I should, as, as for my neurology <laughs> colleagues, mention EMG nerve conduction. So technically speaking, that used to be in the diagnostic, it still is, it's in the diagnostic criteria. It depends on your bend. So I would say, you know, as a human being, if this patient says, do I need that to be diagnosed? Would you do that? Uh, they think the answer is probably no. This is so, this is more that expert opinion that we would <laughs> yeah. we would love to have. Yeah. So I think really when the rash is so clear cut, and if you're trying to decipher because dermatomyositis can be hypomyopathic or amyopathic, in those cases when I'm not entirely sure and want to see if there really is a muscle component, CK actually this is very confusing. But in dermatomyositis, the CK can be rock solid normal. Very confusing. Those cases, EMG nerve conduction is invaluable. The other reason to do EMG nerve conduction for sure if the case isn't this kind of this is pretty fairly clear when you're in that myopathy differential is to help delineate with uh, neuro, other neuromuscular diseases for sure like ALS you're looking for denervation so the so the list so we're looking at the muscles the lungs with PFTs with like a, a lung a diffusion capacity high-res CT maybe a swallowing eval by speech and swallow skin biopsy and then some of the myositis specific stuff that we'll need you to interpret and that's probably definitely outside the scope is a, a biopsy talking about like the histopathology and the myositis specific antibodies the myositis associated antibodies i don't think we can give a list of those but can you tell us how do the myositis specific antibodies in the biopsy how are you using them in your practice to just you you mentioned we're going to get to treatment next how do you use those to to figure things out. Yeah, sure. I mean, without specifics, so th these are so specific that they do not uh, exist in the general population, unlike an ANA. So it really tells me, yep, I've, I've got the diagnosis. You can definitely have dermatomyositis without one of these antibodies, maybe up to like 15 to 20% mm -hmm. of the time. They're helping me categorize and help um, stratify risk stratification. So some of them are more associated with lung disease. Some of them are more associated with cancer. Some of them are more associated with overlaps in mm -hmm. um, other diseases like scleroderma, for example. So I use them to help hone in. There's one antibody I do want to mention, which is um, anti-HMGCR. You might remember, like, I remember in my hazy memory that that is the pharmacologic um, uh, target of statins. An anti-HMGCR antibody in the right clinical context, and somebody here, this, this looks atypical for a, an autoimmune um, statin myopathy, but not impossible. Sometimes there are some rashes that can occur in that. So getting an anti-HMGCR antibody is a quick way for me to say, okay, there's no autoimmune, likely no, it's very sensitive and specific, it's widely available, um, and it's, there is no um, 
autoimmune component to the using the statin. So that's helpful as we go on to talk about what we're going to do with this guy. Could we put the statin back? If that HMGCR antibody is positive, no how, no way. We go talking about PCSK inhibitors and all other ways that are safer. If we do have that as an antibody, the statin is absolutely contraindicated. So it's, it's important potentially here. Now, Paul, you had memorized all the autoantibodies <laughs> ahead of time, and you were you going to recite uh, yeah. them now? Well, no, I mean, I, I no. Um, <laughs> I think as we're, I think we're coming a little bit up against it. I would actually like to hear sort of how we can be helpful in the in the primary care setting for this patient. So, but, so let's let's talk a little bit more about Chris. Um, he started on glucocorticoids and methotrexate. The steroids have been tapered gradually over six months. He's now on a maintenance dose of prednisone, five milligrams, and he comes to sort of his primary care office for general counseling. So, the questions Chris may have for us is. You know, he has muscle inflammation. Can he exercise? Should he exercise? What does that look like for him, and is it is it helpful? Yeah, sure. So I think exercise is not only um, not contraindicated, but absolutely is helpful. So that's another question patients ask all the time. And we used to, just 20 years ago probably, say, sit down, don't move from your couch, you're going to hurt your muscles. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. And people say, how much exercise is enough or too much? You'll know. So the, patients are, <laughs> the patient titrates that for themselves. So obviously, if you've gone and gone axe throwing, which uh, <laughs> uh, the next day, it doesn't feel so great, then you don't do that. Um, lifting weights, however, so heavier weights, I don't recommend. I recommend more reps, less, less weight. You want to, the reason that we bulk muscle is you tear and repair it, and so it's the repair mechanisms are likely injured. So this idea of lifting heavy weights, I suggest against more cardio and um, isometric exercises against, you know, self. I think that's good news for patients with myositis, that they can still move their body, still probably, uh, and help themselves with but that way. So we talked about Chris. We're, we'll let's say he has. Uh, we don't. He does not have st the autoimmune statin myopathy. So we would put him back on. Like once we once we've done our diagnostic, our myositis specific antibodies. Um, we're telling him he can exercise. Don't go too vigorous, uh, especially with the heavy weights. And he can restart his statin. What do we need to do as primary care? I to prompt one thing to prompt you. We we had an episode air today. At, at least if you're here in real time. And uh, we talked about at ACP last week, they were saying anyone on two and a half milligrams of prednisone or more for three months should really be screened with a baseline DEXA. And if they're moderate risk or more, you might put them on bisphosphonate to protect their bones. And it sounds like someone on, with dermatomyositis is certainly going to meet that. So are you using a lot of bone preserving therapy? And what else in primary care can we do to make sure that our patients are getting the best primary care? It's huge. So I, one other thing before we go to bone health is I'm thinking that I, I like you all to remind the patient that I do is, for, particularly in dermatomyositis, is that the sun, because of the photosensitivity of it, oh, yeah. to remind right. patients to use really, and, and we're talking about um, high level, 7,500 SPF. And I once thought, really, is anything over 50 truly helpful? But it, it, it really is. Wide brim hats, if you're a woman or, or, or um, a well, you, anybody can wear a wide brim hat, I guess. Um, so my, my anybody. Pa wear, Paul, uh, Paul, I can't help but think of uh, <laughs> Island of Dr. Moreau. Uh, <laughs> uh, you just protect know. your face. <laughs> Marlon Brando. <laughs> so a quick side note, and this is just for you people here. This is not for anyone who's listening at home. Because you're actually looking down at the top of my head and you see things are getting thinner here. I, I can't remember if I told this story on the podcast before, 30 seconds. <laughs> I went to see a dermatologist, and she said my favorite thing that's ever been told to me in a doctor's office is, have you ever considered incorporating a hat into your wardrobe? <laughs> <laughs> So, so anyway, actually, side yeah. note, speaking of white brim hats, it's something I think about often, <laughs> thanks to the dermatologist. God bless her, who was wonderful, and that's not a dig on her. Anyway, yeah, sorry so, to interrupt. No, no, Carry it's on. all good. Hats are our friend in dermatomyositis, for sure. So any hat, anything with a brim, because if you're in the sun, you want to be careful to protect your face, for sure, which we didn't talk about. Bone health, so important. And really not only screening, but following up and making sure um, for bone protection. Absolutely true. So our uh, internal medicine colleagues are very helpful at reminding us to make sure that we uh, follow DEXAs. I think there's some degree, some rheumatologists, are very involved in doing their own mm. bone health screening, but sometimes that really does uh, come into your wheelhouse as internists for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, especially if someone's tr maybe traveling to see you at a highly specialized center, it might fall more on the primary care. I could I could see that happening for something like um, a myositis. And what about, uh, I mean, vaccinations, it, the timing of vaccinations, you probably think about this a lot for your job. What do you, how do you counsel patients about that? And what should we think about before we're getting people started on treatment? If COVID has taught me anything, it's taught me that, boy, we really are probably underestimating how poorly protected patients mm -hmm. are who are on immunosuppressants. So we, you know, we have work here that has shown certain immunosuppressants making you even more susceptible for sure of not having protective antibodies. So 
and I, I mean, I will tell you that I have like smart phrases and sets uh, to remind me of yeah. the vaccination schedules that I can hardly keep uh, in my head. But Pneumovax and other vaccines that I really think are more at front of, you know, really top of mind now in the COVID era. So right. vaccines are hugely uh, important and for sure for our internal medicine uh, colleagues. Paul, I almost wonder if at some point we're going to be checking titers on folks who are immunosuppressed to see and it, if we'll learn how to interpret titers right now. I know we don't really, yeah. you know, we're like, if it's positive, okay, yeah, there's something <laughs> happening. Yep. We don't know how much that's going to gonna help. Well, what do you think, Paul? Do we, do we have time for audience questions? Is that where we should go next with this? I think that's right. Okay. So if anyone from the audience would like to ask a question, we would be happy to entertain those. If not, we're also happy to end early. And uh, I don't think anyone's ever complained about a, a couple extra minutes in their day. We're not letting you have the head <laughs> Okay. Uh, a question from our, from our Chief Christmas. Oh, Dr. Christmas. You mentioned that you wouldn't expect to see atrophy on the MRI of the thighs at this stage. If you were to see that, would that how would that happen? Yeah, the question, I'll, I'll repeat it. Yeah, so I'll repeat it. So the question is, I wouldn't expect to see atrophy. Would that change my differential? There's a caveat that some of the inflammatory myopathies do have a quick pace, but there's really only one or two that would worry me. I would think more about a dystrophy if I see a lot of atrophy early on, either a dystrophy or another neuromuscular process. That's actually when I'm calling my neurology friends saying, uh, I think this is, this is more in your wheelhouse. So early atrophy is pretty unusual. Inclusion body myositis, we can see atrophy, but at six months, the interesting thing is that the, in inclusion body myositis, by the time they come to our purview, they'll say they've been noticing things for six months, but if you really push them, they're like, oh, yeah, I fell two years ago. So making sure their timeline is also correct. So we do see atrophy um, potentially with poorly treated or delayed treatment in any of the myopathies. So for, for sure, it's possible. But in a six-month time period, that definitely keeps me thinking about dystrophies and, and other mimics. Yeah. This reminds me of just one point that I wanted to bring up that was revelatory to me in preparation is that I always remember as a student, I'm old enough that it was dermatomyositis and polymyositis. Ugh. And when we made the point about the myositis specific antibodies and the biopsies, now we're knowing, now we're understanding that polymyositis really probably a bunch of different things that now we're super specialized. And it's, it was so humbling to see like how many different phenotypes and antibodies and biopsy types that, that have made that into multiple things. I, I don't know that, how much more you want to say about that, but... I think that's another podcast, but yeah. yeah, yeah. But, right. but I will say that it keeps me employed, for yeah. sure. You, the I, rheumatology I, podcast, that's like a rheumatology <laughs> podcast. I could imagine like a whole series on myositis-specific yeah, uh, stuff. Yeah, I, I think it just makes us think, like the word polymyositis, like really very quickly, and just very quick. I love sort of, in my head, I always think you should think about a few things, which is the antisynthetase syndrome, which in a, in a very, very quick, that is like, remember in your hazy memory that Joe won is so associated or the antibodies that are cousins to Joe one that is a syndromic process so there you're looking for roughening of the hands called mechanics hands lung disease arthritis myositis fever that's a systemic process that's in our wheelhouse and it depends if you're a lumper or a splitter I, I, I think you should split that off because I think it's important to think about that muscular dystrophy we already talked about inclusion body myositis and then any of the overlaps um, anything that so it's important because it's not just semantics if scleroderma is linked there often we don't see sclerodactyly and overt scleroderma we see tiny telangiectasias maybe mm. a little Raynaud's so they still have all the systemic complications so you know in my head just a quick check checkbox and then obviously as I said before, muscular dystrophy, adult onset muscular dystrophy, absolute mimic of these things, or you know, and occasionally um, uh, motor neuron disease. Yeah. A question from the chat is: Are there particular types of cancer that are more associated? Yeah. So ovarian cancer is overrepresented in dermatomyositis for ways we really don't understand, and this is not a cancer you see in the you know general population as often. So we, for sure, in women, often do a transvaginal ultrasound. Really have to be carefully looking for that early. Often I say that it's the dermatomyositis that brought the cancer to the forefront. Other than that, it tends to be those that are common in the population. So more lung, breast, colon prostate. Uh, but for sure, uh, and then in younger people, maybe some more hematologic malignancies, but ovarian cancer is highly overrepresented, and so that's another, I'm glad you mentioned it. I do want to take one, one minute to make sure that I address the atorvastatin issue. You had mentioned, should we restart it? The answer is you should restart it. But I have learned from my cardiology colleagues that I just don't go full force restarting it, because oh, in, the, in rare instances, for whatever reason, that myotoxin is enough to uh, 
exacerbate weakness in a rare subset of the population. Mm. So it starts slow and low. Always start every other day. So I do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday for at least a month, checking a CK carefully monthly, and then gradually increase that. So like 10, 20, 40, something like or, that. Or, or, right, right. So not only increasing the dose, but increasing the timing. So trying a Monday, Wednesday, Friday at first mm -hmm. and seeing whether or not, and interestingly, some people have excellent cholesterol reduction, even with a Monday, Wednesday, Friday dose. Yeah, sure. So just making sure we don't overdose them. I want to make sure that I make that a point. Wonderful. Great. So I think uh, we'll take one last question from the audience up there. I think we learned in medical school that certain mites have this type of privilege for its proxy versus digital muscle groups. Can you put that into your differential diagnosis? Is that something that's understood um, why pathways affect certain muscle groups other than the rest of the all cell muscles? Or is that no longer clear? So, so the question is why proximal versus distal, and is there any understanding about that? Oh, I, gosh, no, you can come to a, a full uh, fellowship to try to understand that. Why proximal versus distal? We really don't know. And interestingly, even in the proximal muscles, if you look carefully, if you actually look at an MRI, it's such a symmetric process that you could lay one thigh over on another. It's almost like a, a, a perfect mirror image. I find it absolutely amazing that the rectus femoris is often affected in the exact same way, whereas some of the adductors can be spared. So not only do we not understand proximal versus distal, we don't even understand within proximal the targeted, um, you know, the targeted muscles. Inclusion body myositis is fascinating in this way, and that the quadriceps are affected. So the knee extensors are almost exclusively affected all the time, yet knee flexors remain strong until nearly the day people die for, you know, of something else with IBM. So really interesting question. I don't know. It helps us, you know, from a differential standpoint clinically, but pathologically, I have no idea why. Should we, should we sign off officially? Uh, people have 30 seconds for us to sign off or should we? Okay. I mean, I hate for you to miss this magic. So yeah, yeah sit, sit tight for this. <laughs> All right, this has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Great, great. <laughs> I hope that's humiliating. <laughs> <laughs> get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com, and while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, plus twice each month. You get our new Curbsiders Digest, which recaps our latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge, and to do that, we want your feedback, so please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or now on Spotify. You can also contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. And a special thanks to uh, Dr. Christopher Stein, Dr. Gail Birkenblit for inviting us, and uh, to my co-host, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, oh, and to our whole team at The Curbsiders. A lot of people make this show happen. Podpaste uh, does editing and production for the show. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And Paul, with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. Strong work, and I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you, and goodbye. Goodbye.